so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me, Molly. It's a delight to be back here. Almost two years today, I think, since I first appeared in one of these interviews, just before the pandemic. So a lot of water's gone under the bridge in that time. Well, it's great to have you. We'll start at the very beginning. Um, many of our members here might be interested in joining MI6 themselves. Um, what made you interested um, to become involved in the Secret Intelligence Service? I think I was primarily interested in international affairs, to be honest. Um, I'd been brought up abroad, born abroad, and had studied sort of political science at university. Uh, and so it was a sort of natural progression, really, to want to do a job that involved overseas travel and looking at overseas cultures, and in a way, understanding those cultures perhaps rather deeper than most people might. Um, so really, that's how it came about, and I had the choice, really, of being a, a journalist or becoming an intelligence professional and I chose the intelligence professional route. And what advice would you give to a member who wants to get that sort of infamous tap on the shoulder? I'm not sure they do it anymore, do they? It's very old fashioned. Um, and in fact, it didn't really happen to me. I was recruited through a, an advert in a newspaper, um, which was from a headhunter. So th there are different ways of coming at this. There are different ways of being recruited uh, and working inside. And, and you know, it's a matter of, trying to target and find your way, I think, through this sort of maze of online tests, questionnaires, interviews. I would say if you get to meet a real human being, you're doing pretty well in that process. Um, and it's obviously a very high risk job and I imagine quite um, stressful. What was it like to work in that environment? I think it was very variable. I think you're right. I think you have to be quite a risk taker. You have to be quite adventurous um, to do it. Um, and obviously some of us are masochists and go for the hard postings and the hard jobs. And, you know, I arrived in Moscow as a 25 year old um, into a similar sort of geopolitical time of turmoil as we're seeing now. Um, in that in those days, it was the Soviet Union that was collapsing and the West was ideologically triumphing and um, our way of life and our rules of law and all the rest of it seem to be predominant. Um, so in a sense, although it was very tough and very demanding, it was also very rewarding. I think it's very difficult now at the moment. What do you mean by at the moment? With really the way in which uh, the Russia crisis, the rise of China and so on is making um, democracies really much more uh, divided amongst themselves and much less confident, I think, of the, the value systems and the sort of fundamental characteristics that we all took to be, in uh, Fukuyama's words, the end of history, which didn't prove out to be the case. Well, I'll ask you about um, Ukraine in a moment, but um, looking back at your career, is there a moment that you were most frightened for Britain? Um, there were one or two moments I was very frightened for myself, but um, they will remain nameless. I think that this, I have to say, and I know you're going to ask me about it in a minute, but I think we have to address it earlier rather than later. This is a very dangerous moment in, in our history, and I would suspect that it's the most dangerous moment geopolitically in my lifetime, let alone yours. Um, I was born, I think, the year after the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I think was the last situation that is comparable with the one that we're facing at the moment, sadly. And you ran the Russia desk um, at the MI6 headquarters. As, the, as we watch the war in Ukraine progress, is there anything that you feel the general public should be paying attention to particularly? There's a lot of things which I think have been misunderstood about modern Russia and the threat it poses to us. I think one of them is essentially that um, over time under Putin, the boundaries between the government, business and organized crime have more or less collapsed. And so the threat that we face is, is quite a deep, profound one. And it's not just coming from obvious state actors, it's coming from business folks, it's becoming from agents of influence in the West, some of whom are things like former German chancellors and former prime ministers of France. And so it's a very disturbing sort of plasma, if you like, that we're facing that, that is difficult to de determine and difficult to contain. And do you think that the UK could have done more to prevent the crisis that we're watching currently? I think the UK could have done a lot more to um, clamp down, if you like, to regulate, to um, control uh, Russian money, 
and Russian business and so on over the last period. Um, and that's a big subject. And I think that we're only waking up now to really what we should have been doing 10 or 15 years ago. Did you expect Russia to invade Ukraine? Uh, I expected them to carry out a military operation of some sort. I didn't think it would be on this scale and I didn't think it would be this dramatic. And what are your views on the UK's stance, um, I suppose the UN stance as well? What do you think we should be looking for going forward? I think our stance has been broadly right uh, in that we have um, obviously defined what NATO is at the moment. And you know, with the best will in the world, Ukraine was not in a position or a state to join NATO up until this point and not really into the foreseeable future. But I think the support of Ukraine, the support of democracy there, the way in which um, we have not only done so diplomatically, we've now imposed very severe sanctions on Russia, which is the right thing to do, but also things like supplying weaponry and what have you. I think that we broadly, although we've woken up rather late in a sense to, to Putin and Russia, we're now doing the right things. And you said that we may have misunderstood many of the actors in uh, sort of the beginning of this crisis. Do you expect economic sanctions to be effective? Not in the short term, but I think longer term, they will create serious problems for, for Russia and for Putin's regime. Fundamentally, my belief is that Russia has overreached in this operation. It doesn't have the wealth or the manpower or anything else to occupy a neighbouring country of 43 million people against their will. And I, and I think that what they were counting on, and we can talk about the way in which um, information moves around autocratic regimes, but the fundamental miscalculation here has clearly been that Ukraine wouldn't fight back and that the sort of quislings, fifth columnists, mercenaries, people they bought up um, to provide a shadow governance structure are not really there. And so they, at the very best, even with military vic victory, they'll be looking at a vacuum in Ukraine politically, which is a big problem for them. Well, let's talk about um, the miscalculations. Why do you think that they were made in the way that they were? So there are different miscalculations here. One of them I've just mentioned, which is a logistic one, really, in terms of uh, Russian capabilities. And I think that um, was... I'm not sure why that came about, presumably because the Russians had bad intelligence or that people within Putin's bubble were telling him things that he wanted to hear rather than things that he should have been hearing. I think the miscalculation secondary one is the, the way in which the West has reacted, the strength of the reaction, the unity of the reaction. And I think that was based upon our failure to act decisively over a number of years. I, I don't think that we are seeing in this operation anything fundamentally different in terms of Russian behavior and intent. Um, if you go back to as early as um, arguably the apartment bombings in Moscow uh, in 1999, um, where you seem to have had um, a false flag operation conducted by Russian security services, which involved blowing up their own people to justify a war in Chechnya. You know, this is now 25 years old or so, this, this process. So I think that um, Russia has behaved in a sort of linear way over time. There have been peaks of rogue state behavior which are quite clear. Um, but I think they expected the, the West to react in a divided and weak way. I think I'm certain that the debacle in Kabul um, last summer will have encouraged this sort of operation to take place. Um, and our speaker yesterday suggested that um, Putin had changed as he'd been isolated over the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as you said, you spoke here exa almost exactly two years ago. Do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has had a role to play in either uh, the beginning of this crisis or in our response? Again, there's a bigger question here, which is what does the pandemic and its management, its handling, how does it reflect upon different governance systems? Have we become weaker because of the pandemic? Has China become stronger, etc.? I mean, I would argue the pandemic has not been handled particularly well in the West and that we have kind of, it's accelerated a number of processes, I think. One is the rise of China, which ironically started it, but seems to be the, 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 the most fundamental beneficiary. 
Um, secondly, um, obviously, it coincided with a frankly chaotic US administration under Donald Trump, which again accelerated America's relative decline, I think, in the world. Uh, and thirdly, it probably meant that Putin was more isolated and more detached from the real universe, you know, the bubble that he lives in, clearly. I mean, literally, when he's sitting 20 feet away from his top brass officers in meetings. Um, so I think that um, the West has not had a good pandemic, fundamentally. Um, you <clears throat> mentioned Donald Trump. Uh, let's, let's speak about that for a moment. Um, you authored the Steele dossier, which alleges misconduct and conspiracy and cooperation between Trump and Russia, um, sort of prior to the 2016 election. Could you begin, just in case anyone here is not familiar, giving us a brief sort of summary of those findings? So I think there were three elements to uh, what's being called the dossier. It was actually a series of single source intelligence reports over a period of time, if you like, a, almost a running commentary on the election campaign and Russia's perspective on it. And it comes from the Russian end of the telescope, if you like. The sources were Russian. They were reporting on how Russia saw it. And of course, that may in some cases be rather different than how it was viewed in, in America and at the other end of the telescope. But it comprised three basic things. One was there was a whole scale campaign to interfere in the US election, that it was supported and funded by the Russian leadership, including Putin. Uh, thirdly, that it was designed primarily uh, to assist Donald Trump and to damage Hillary Clinton, rather than just to sow chaos in the American electorate. Uh, and fourthly, that there were elements of collusion between the members of the Trump campaign and the Russians and their agents. And that, that was what it basically comprised. And it was leaked in 20, 2017, I believe, without your permission. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that process like, watching it become public? Terrifying. Um, <laughs> so um, it was initially produced for a law firm that was connected with the Clinton campaign. It was subsequently shared with the FBI and our own security services. Um, and then um, the step that led to its being uh, leaked and becoming uh, a matter of discussion in the world's media was a leak to the press by someone who was working for a US senator, John McCain, who we also had taken it to fearing for America's national security after Donald Trump had been elected. So it was quite a shock when it came out. Um, and as some people may know, uh, we decided, I decided to go into hiding basically for a month or two to regather our strength and reassess where we were and all the rest of it. There were numerous threats against us. Um, it's not that uncommon these days to get death threats if you're a public figure, but certainly it was quite a worrying time. Um, and the reaction in certainly the US could be described <laughs> as almost some, some kind of mass panic about um, Russian interference. Do you think that that was justified? It was a <clears throat> panic maybe, but I think it was more of a, a sort of Marmite reaction. It was more of a, um, it, it was a divisive reaction. Something that we would always have considered in our careers in government to be bread and butter consensus national security territory. <clears throat> the interference of a hostile authoritarian state in your elections, uh, we never had any clue that it would become such a partisan, such a divisive, such a, a non-conformity um, issue over the years. I mean, it's been extraordinary uh, how it's dragged on and still actually dragging on now, five years later. Do you think that um, the takeaways that the sort of general public seemed <laughs> to take were the right ones from the dossier? Are they different to what you were finding at the time? There was a, a sort of tabloid uh, focus on salacious elements of it, um, inevitably, I suppose. Um, but I think in general, the takeaway was that, that Russia had become a very much an emboldened country and government and really a rogue government. And I, th I think we're seeing that now uh, in spades. And I, th I think that that was really a big step for them to interfere in that way in a US election. And I think it was another 
Rubicon, if you like, that they've crossed, and they've crossed another one now by invading a neighbouring state. So I, I, again, I see it. I see it personally as part of a process, and characteristically the same as some of the other things we had witnessed. We had Skripal afterwards, and so on. But I think it's it's all of a piece, really, with the nature of the regime. And in your opinion, now it's been published or leaked, um, do you believe that the general public do have the right to know what goes on between political leaders? Is it something that you are still regretful that it's in the public eye? I'm regretful that the detail is in the public eye, which puts sources and methods at risk and can only aid our enemies. Um, but the actual <coughs> message, which was essentially that the four points that I made earlier, um, that it was a whole scale campaign of interference sanctioned by Putin and the leadership, aimed at damaging Hillary Clinton and electing Trump, and, be, and that there was elements of collusion with his team. I think those elements did need to be in the public domain because they set down a precedent. And in fact, as early as sort of the spring of 17, which was just after this, we saw similar things going on in France with the election of Macron with an attempt to hack his campaign and so on. So I think, I think it, it, it was a signpost along this route that has led directly to where we are today. And you characterise this as sort of characteristic of the regime in Russia. With that in mind, do you think you know what we might see next? <sighs> Very difficult question. Um, I think the, re the, the regime has changed. It's hardened. It's become more isolated, as you've said, in the world more deaf, I would argue, to rational argument. Um, I'm not a sort of doomsday merchant. I don't believe that we're in a week's time we're going to be watching nuclear missiles land on us. But I, but I do think that this is a very dangerous moment because it's, to me, it's perhaps more of a First World War type scenario than a Second World War type scenario. Everyone talks about it and the framework of it being like Munich and 38 and what happened subsequently. There's almost as much a risk that it's more like um, 1914. And in fact, what you will see is some kind of mistake made in Poland or in Slovakia or Romania, um, which leads to an attack on one of those by Russians in retaliation. And then we are dragged into this abyss. And I think that is what would keep me up at night. I, I don't think that, I mean, NATO is a great thing, but I think that there was talk, I think, this morning of Poland providing airfields for Ukrainian aircraft. I mean, that is the slippery slope, I think. Do you think NATO will uh, avoid, avoid sort of direct conflict? And I think probably, but it's not certain. And I think that these things, by their nature, have a tendency to get out of hand I think they talk a bit in the First World War that you know that the railway timetables took over rather than the generals, and I think that's the risk that we are in today. I'd like to talk more about your sort of early career. Um, in the 90s, early 90s, as you said, you worked in Moscow for a few years. Yeah. What did you learn about um, learn from that experience, and can you tell us more about what it taught you about the culture of Russia? I learned a huge amount, uh, both good and bad. I learned that. Russian people are great people with a fantastic language and culture um, and they have suffered massively in history. They are some of the biggest victims of, of history. The number of, I, I always thought back to the number of people who died in Russia in my father's lifetime, uh, which was 1932 to uh, 2014, was just incredible. Millions and millions and millions. And so in a sense, I empathize with them as a people, but I also think that they are not being active enough at the moment in protesting and, and toppling their regime, which is doing generational damage to them. Uh, in Russia in 1990 to 93, when I was there, the sort of arc of history was moving in the positive direction. So it was a different sort of experience than seeing it move in the other direction. I think one of the things that always lived with me on afterwards was, <clears throat> first of all, the brutality of their history. <clears throat> but secondly, the fact that in other Eastern European and Soviet bloc countries, when the Berlin Wall came down and the regimes were toppled, the security apparatus was dismantled. 
And sadly, in Russia, that never happened. And I can well remember that um, surveillance teams that were deployed on us on a regular basis went down for about three days after the coup in 91 and they were then back and they've never gone away. It's probably unfair to ask you um, to solve the crisis here on this stage, but what does a solution um, look like for you going forward for Russia? What do you think we should be looking for? I don't immediately see one, to be honest. I think um, I've been arguing for several years that, that, that our objectives with Putin should be containment. Um, the problem is that Putin and the people around him have a, a warped view of themselves and of the West in particular. And they have a zero sum view of the world. So they don't really believe in win-win scenarios. They believe that if something benefits them, it's damaging to the West. And if something benefits the West, it's damaging to them. And that's a mindset which is very difficult to engage with. And no matter how much you understand Russia and you know Russians and you understand their culture and so on, their history, um, the fact is that this is a, a gangster regime. And that's the only words you can use to describe it. The people in charge are gangsters. They murder people. They um, steal wealth. They lie without any morals or any comp uh, compunction. And so it's a real challenge to engage with them in any meaningful way other than as a quizzling. And um, I think that we still need to be looking at containment as a strategy, however difficult that is in the present circumstances. And later in your career, you spent time in Afghanistan. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, that's disinformation, actually, um, to be honest. Um, but what I did do was work for a while on Iraq post-invasion and involving the insurgency and involving um, attempts, really, to get elections and elements of democracy and the rule of law introduced in a place like Iraq, which is a much smaller scale than, than Russia. Um, and obviously was very difficult. Um, so it's when you get out there and you see what the real world's really like, you realize that your own society, this society, is quite an unusual place with tremendous sort of positives and values, and that it's very easy to get complacent about them. I mean, if you look back to the Second World War and, and, and the way in which Britain was isolated and fighting a whole continent of authoritarian, totalitarian regimes. It's a miracle that we, we came through in the end because, make no mistake, Stalin's regime was pretty much as bad as Hitler's in many ways. Um, somebody said that at least Hitler didn't shoot his generals when they lost battles. But the fact that we came through that period at tremendous cost and tremendous sort of investment of our parents' generation, really my parents' generation, is something that's been easily forgotten and taken for granted, the sort of society that we have here. And has your view on that changed um, sort of over your career as you've worked in different places and as I suppose the UK has changed? Yes and no. I think that um, when you look at things like corruption, for example, most countries are fundamentally corrupt. And in some countries, that corruption goes right down to the, to the roots. Uh, it certainly did in Russia. When I was there, there used to be a comment that no traffic policeman in Russia could possibly live on the, on the salary that they were paid. And therefore, the only way that they could have a subsistence existence was to extort money from motorists. Uh, not from us, because we had diplomatic immunity, but it's that, it's that kind of structural corruption, structural um, lack of justice, another one. So there are a whole, thing, a whole series of values that, that, you know, as I say, we fought for in this country for hundreds of years. And if you live in a country like Iraq under Saddam, or you live in a country like China under Xi, you're back pretty much in Henry VIII sort of territory as far as Britain is concerned. And it's really quite sobering. And if you were sort of, I suppose, joining MI6 now, how do you think your career would be different uh, given COVID and the technological advances we've seen 
I mean, I think in general, joining government is, 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 is very difficult and very different than it was before. I mean, you've got this kind of 24 hour news, you've got the TikTok wars, you've got, um, you know, you've got everyone with a, with a, with a camera phone everywhere in the world. And it, it, it's almost a matter of, um, you know, erase the bottom in some ways, and the media is a bit like that as well. So I think if you're if you're going into diplomacy or intelligence these days, I mean, the key thing is to get uh, fully immersed in the cultures and, and, and the countries that you are studying and working on, to to gain a fundamental understanding of them, their languages, their history, live amongst the people as much as you possibly can, although that's sometimes quite difficult and develop that real sort of deep expertise where you almost have a sixth sense of, of how a country's going to act, how a country's going to behave, how a particular issue is going to be regarded in that country. And I think that's the way forward. Um, and how do you think, you sort of touched on TikTok generation, that kind of thing. Yeah. How do you think social media will play a part in this country's security going forward? Well, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it, really? Um, I was talking to somebody just now about how, you know, no doubt true of future politicians as well, you know, once something's on social media, it's in a sense it's there forever. And the sort of misspent news that we all no doubt um, had in the 1980s um, have never seen the light of day because there was no social media. So I, I think it will have a mixed impact um, I think it's obviously exploitable by hostile elements and hostile regimes, as we, we've already been told that um, LinkedIn's been used to try and target British officials, I think, by the Chinese intelligence services at the very least. But on the other hand, it will also be play a really cr cr critical role, I think, in, in sort of on-the-ground reporting, you know, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan, there was no video coverage of what they were doing to the population or what they were doing to the cities and, and, and how many of them were there and what they were being told. Now you've got really quite good coverage of some of this stuff, and I think that's a positive. And do you worry for the future of um, UK elections? I worry to some extent about that, uh, but only fundamentally over, over funding, really, of the political parties. I think our system of um, paper ballots and good old fashioned pencils and everything else makes uh, interference in the actual votes quite difficult. I do worry that, um, that the politics has become very polarized in this country, not as bad as America, where even fundamental values of national security and so on have been split apart. Um, but I think we have to take note of what's happened in places like America and be very careful not to let them take hold here. And you're an expert on Russia. You've spoken about, um, I suppose, the fall of the US, the rise of China. What do you think we should be looking for, sort of, I guess, across the global stage in the next year or two years? I think it depends whether you're talking about Europe or the wider world. I think in Europe, Russia is the key factor, the key unpredictable, the key destabiliser. Um, I think in the wider world, China, and in the longer term, will become more of a challenge to us because of its economic power and its size. Um, so in a sense, you're almost looking at, I think the phrase is, Russia makes the weather, but China makes the climate, which is probably true in a literal sense as well, given its level of emissions and so on in the climate crisis, which of course has now been put on the back burner because of all this, as has the humanitarian catastrophe in Afghanistan that is developing and no one is now talking about anymore. Um, so we have to get serious. I mean, I think a lot of the disc political discourse in this country, um, you know, is not really serious or real world enough to understand and appreciate just what a challenge we've co got coming, because I think it's a big challenge. Well, thank you so much for um, answering my questions. I'm keen to move to audience questions. If yeah. you have one, do raise your hand or your membership card. Um, and we'll take a question from the member on the bench just there. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks. Um, you spoke before about um, Russian meddling in British elections, in um, the US as well, uh, and your disappointment at the lack of 
Russian resistance to to Putin, effectively. Um, does the UK, does the US have their own initiatives to build fifth column, to build um, resistance within places like Russia and China? Or is that something that they abstain from? Ultimately, I don't entirely know the answer to that question, not definitively. Um, in general, the experience of trying to do that kind of operation has not been a good one. Um, and it's much better in so many ways if the people of those countries topple their own governments, have their own sort of leverage over their own governments. I think it's very important that our values and our education and everything else is made and travel is made available to people from those places, particularly young people, particularly the elite, dare I say, um, that they are exposed effectively to our values and our culture. Because by and large, when you talk to young Russians, certainly in private, you know, there's no doubt they vote for their, with their feet in our direction. The problem is that they've got a, a very um, entrenched security and militaristic apparatus, which is suppressing them on a daily basis and lying to them on a daily basis. And so information is very important. Communications are very important. And things like culture are very important. They're slow working, but they are effective. And that's where we need to be looking, I think. And we'll take a question from the elected member of Access Committee. How do, how do you think Putin's decision to invade Ukraine, what impact do you think it will have on the Chinese position towards Taiwan? Do you think it will cause an acceleration in their aim of forced reunification, or do you think it's too soon to tell? Going to absolute basics here, I think that the Russian, the difficulty of the Russian operation in Ukraine will... I mean, it is going through some difficulties now, but fundamentally the difficulty is the longer term. So in other words, rolling your tanks across the border is the easy bit, and actually coming to some kind of settlement. It, there's this old phrase, if you break it, you own it, uh, as the Americans found out in Iraq. And I think that is what Russia will face. Whereas I think for China and Taiwan, the difficult bit's the first bit. It's getting the Navy and the troops across the straits. That isn't at all straightforward. And I suspect that um, there's quite a high chance that actually uh, a Chinese invading Navy would be sunk uh, on the way across. So I think that's their calculation. They're also, they're also much more gradualist, much slower in trying to achieve their objectives, the Chinese. They're not, they have a different mentality to the Russians. The Russians are like, uh, have a sense of entitlement as a world power that is probably no, no longer justified by their population and their wealth. The Chinese are much more reticent. They're much careful, more careful, slower to do what they're doing. I think they realize that economic power actually is, 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 is paramount in the rise of their country and not military power. And, and therefore, if they're going to be able to reincorporate someone like Taiwan, it's probably going to be done economically rather than necessarily militarily, I think. Um, we'll take a question from the member on the front bench just over here. Um, you mentioned Russia's use of misinformation in the campaign. Do you think there's scope for, and is it the time for democracies to use misinformation towards strategic and tactical aims? Not in a sort of policy sense, no. Um, it may be on a, on a battlefield in Ukraine, there may be some space for using disinformation to confuse a, an enemy. But I think fundamentally what democracies should be doing is, I do believe that you know, our communications and everything else, as I've said, is very important. But fundamentally, we should have the confidence to rely on truth. And it should be the truth that we are, you know, broadcasting into Russia and other places where uh, the truth is a very low priority, if at all, in the governance of the country. And I do believe that the budgets for, you know, the BBC and Radio Free Europe and all the others should be you know, increase and we should be trying to communicate more systematically with the populations of these countries than we are at the moment. In their languages, obviously, as well. Um, we'll take a question from the member just over here. 
Um, thank you for a very interesting uh, talk. Um, so I'm from Sweden, and in Sweden there's a lot of talk now about joining NATO as well, and, and that is also going on in Finland. Um, as you know, Putin's narrative or is that the existence of NATO wasn't or isn't justified after the fall of Soviet. And he has been complaining about how NATO has been expanding. And as far as I understand it, that is the main concern, so to speak. So I'm just wondering, first of all, if you think it was a mistake to expand NATO to the, to the Baltic countries or Poland, uh, and secondly, what do you think uh, would be a wise strategy for Finland and Sweden in regards to NATO membership at this point? Very good question. Um, I don't think it was a mistake to expand NATO. Um, I think ultimately, if a country is um, sovereign and if a country's system of governance and its system of law and its system of military uh, and defence policy is compatible with NATO's requirements, then it should be free to apply to join NATO. I think there were some mistakes made going back away, um, particularly by the former Vice President Cheney in the day, um, talking about Georgia joining and Ukraine joining, you know, massively prematurely. Um, I think that joining NATO is a big step, clearly, for any country to accept that it is responsible for the collective defence of many other countries um, is a huge change, actually. Um, and if I was running Sweden and Finland now, I would be thinking very carefully about joining. I'd be looking at the compatibility of um, that with you know, other commitments and other um, responsibilities and so on. But I think ultimately both Finland and Sweden should be free to join NATO if that's what their people want and, and we should welcome them in. NATO, after all, is a defensive alliance. It is, it is not conceivable in any real world situation that NATO would attack Russia. It's ridiculous. And a question from the member in the blue jumper. Hi, thank you for coming. Uh, I wanted to comment on two things. Uh, first, Putin pretty much threatened the West, uh, the West with a nuclear war uh, a couple of days ago. I'm wondering if that's what makes you make the comparison with the Cuban Missile Crisis, or even if before that threat, that was something that was on your mind. And secondly, there have been stories, I think mostly unproven, about Putin's mental health. Uh, and I wanted to know whether in a system like Russia's that hasn't, doesn't seem to have m many checks and balances, whether that sort of thing is, is relevant and so something we should be thinking about. I've certainly thought up until now that, that Russia was not a monolithic country. Um, you know, and I've, I've seen a lot of intelligence over the years, both government and our own private, which suggests that actually it's quite a complex government and leadership, far more so than you might think. What they do, of course, is that they don't show that to us in the open. We don't have debates in the Duma where people are ripping shreds off each other, um, and that makes it more difficult to read. Um, I am concerned, however, that certainly over the last couple of years, um, that kind of collective pluralism in the leadership that, that Russia seems to have had uh, in the past, in the recent past, seems to be weaker. So I am concerned that um, it's become more autocratic, more di dictatorial, under Putin, and that's a big cause of concern. And I think the difference between the Cuban Missile Crisis and the situation we're in now um, is that the Soviet Union had structures, the Soviet Union had, however perverse they might have seen, uh, seemed uh, collective ways of doing things. The architecture of the state was the real architecture of the state and so on. The situation we've got at the moment is that it's very difficult to discern who has influence over Putin and how it's exercised. And um, a lot of it's very capricious, a lot of it's very personal. It's far more like an Ottoman court, Russia now, than the Soviet Union was like a sort of structured communist state. And the amount of power I think that Putin has accumulated in his own hands now is a really big problem. We'll take a question from the member in the scarf. Behind you, Spencer. 
Sorry, one other thing on that. I, I don't think he's about to go to a nuclear war with us or a nuclear strike. I don't think it's got to that point. And um, yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that even you know the, the, the lunatics running North Korea have never got to that stage. So I think it's pretty unlikely. But there is a small threat of it. And uh, the threat will come if things spiral out of control in the way that we were talking about just now. What do you think of Zelensky's decision making so far during the conflict? And do you think Ukraine has a chance of achieving their goals of joining NATO and um, the EU and repelling the current Russian force? I think Zelensky has been exemplary in the way he has run his country uh, over this last period. Vastly exceeded expectations given that you know his background wasn't one in politics or the military. Um, and he will emerge from history as a hero in, in, in some ways like um, Dubček and others yeah. in the past. However, I do think that the, re- that the government in, in Ukraine will probably fall uh, and that in the, in the short term, um, Ukraine will not um, be a free and, and, and democratic country. Medium to longer term, I'd be quite optimistic that, um, that we can get to a situation where um, we have a more reasonable government running Russia, even if it's autocratic, um, and that Ukraine can get some breathing space. My real fear is that in six months' time, um, Kiev and Kharkiv will look like Aleppo did in Syria. And, and that's what we've got to try and avoid at all costs. We probably have time for one final question. Um, the member in the black coat just there. Hi, um, I was just wondering about your comment earlier that um, Russia makes the weather, yet China makes the climate. What do you think in this situation China's role will be, if indeed any role? I think China's caught on a dilemma, really, because China's rhetoric as a state is that the sovereignty of countries is inviolable uh, and that it's actually quite a... China is actually quite a conservative country in some ways, geopolitically, uh, in a way that Russia isn't. On the other hand, obviously, um, China does have this rivalry with the US. It is in China's interest that US be discredited around the world in whatever situation you're talking, whether it's Kabul airport or whatever. Um, And so I think China's views of this will be very mixed. Uh, China will never be Russia's ally. And in fact, I would argue that if there there, there ever will be a land invasion of Russia, it will come from China, not from the West. Um, But China will like the fact that, that America and the West have been distracted by this, are gonna have to spend vast resources on this whilst they will quietly go about their business in other parts of the world, um, importing oil from Iran or whatever they do and buying up large parts of Africa and Sri Lanka and other places. But fundamentally, I don't think the Chinese leadership is supportive of the sort of instability and unpredictability of where we are at the moment. And obviously, it's not in China's interest that a a full-scale war would break out in this part of the world or that there'll be a nuclear exchange. So I, I think they'll, that in public they will be neutral, if not slightly sneering towards the West. In private, they're probably telling Putin where his red lines are, I suspect. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that um, this invasion took place the day after the, um, or virtually the day after the Olympics had ended in, in Beijing. And I think that tells you something of the of the relative power relationship between China and Russia in reality. Well, Christopher, thank you so much for joining us. We'll finish with a question we've asked all of our speakers this term, which is uh, if you could leave our audience this evening with one thing to think about for the rest of the week, what would that be? I think it's that life is about, and careers particularly, about taking calculated risks. And if you don't risk anything, you don't achieve anything. And when I look back on my career, a lot of it happened not by chance, but not predictably. But I would say that the big things that I've done in my life that have been positive, whether it was going to Russia on a posting at 25 or leaving a civil service job at 
50, 45 and starting up a small business, all the things I've done in life that I look back on with great pride have involved risk, albeit a calculated risk. Thank you so much. Um, do join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. in the chamber for our emergency event on Ukraine. We'll have um, a panel of specialists to talk about the changing situation. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Christopher. Please join me in welcoming um, or thanking Christopher Steele.